If we were to examine our emotional makeup from our sadness to joy, from anger to exuberance, from being a bully to being a doormat, would we say that we deal with our emotions in a godly way? Maybe not often enough. Do we place ourselves under the control of the Lord or are we out of balance? Do we see sin within our emotions? I'm sure that some of us would cop out pretty quickly and say, well, you know, it's who I am, you know, that's just it. Oh, yeah, sure, I lose my temper and I pout, and, uh, but that, that's not me. Yeah, that's just how I am. Is that our attitude? Is that a right attitude? I think we all do want balance in our emotions, but how do we determine if we're out of balance? Obviously, we need a standard by which to make that measurement, and that's what we have in God's Word, right? We can go to the Word to see if we're right or not. God's Word, our measurement. Jesus Christ, He is the one to whom we can look at and learn from if we're out of balance or if we're expressing our emotions the way God would have us to. This morning, we're going to look at three individuals to see how they handle their emotions, so that we can bring our emotions under the control of the Holy Spirit. And then as we come to the Lord's table to remember Christ's sacrifice for us, what he did for us. If you got your outline, the first point we want to look, make and we want to look at Jesus is emotions under, under perfect control, obviously, Jesus. And yet we see in Jesus the full range of our emotions. Emotions are not the issue in our lives. We are emotions. God has emotions. Jesus has emotions. What is the issue is the control of those emotions. I want us to see that we must not allow our emotions to control our emotions. You think about that. Jesus Christ controlled his. He was emotional. Let's look at five expressions of the Lord's emotions. The first one, point A, is that Jesus expressed anger, right? We know that. He, but he did it in a righteous way because he's perfect man, God. So how do we handle our anger? In John chapter 2, in this passage, we have Jesus early in ministry, and he's, it's the cleansing of the temple, right? The clearing of the temple, the money-making money uh, merchants who were there, and they had no business doing that in the temple, profiteering. In verse 15, Jesus goes at it really forcefully, and he drives them out. In verse 16, specifically, he addresses those selling doves. Why? Because they were making the most profit out of the deal. How wrong and corrupt that was. Get out of here, he says. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Verse 17, the disciples remembered what was said in Psalm 69 which speaks of God's zeal, being jealous for his house. The word jealous, silly, biblically, talks about wanting that which is rightfully theirs, what God is rightfully belonging to him. God shows his emotions. Jesus is full of emotions. Do we see hatred? No, not hatred. But we see his anger towards sin. Jesus wants righteousness from us. He wants us to have pure hearts, pure emotions. He has a passion for what ought to be in the house of God when he calls it my father's house. In Mark chapter 3, we've seen another incident of the Lord's anger. Going back to chapter 2, verse 23, he was uh, in contention with the Pharisees, right, in the keeping of the Sabbath. So in chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, Jesus knows the heart of the Pharisees, and he knew their sinfulness and their wickedness. In verse 5, you see the anger of Jesus. Because of these, Pharisees were not concerned about the physical nor the spiritual needs of others. They wanted power. They were full of themselves. Christ's anger was real. But it wasn't the expression of his anger that would be out of an injuring and self-centeredness. Too often our anger is about a self-centered heart, 
I got to have it my way, and we explode if we don't. Jesus was angry at their sin, their wickedness. Look at verse 5. The tense that Matthew uses here of the verb looked around in anger is a past tense. It's a moment in time. So you just had this burst of anger. What is in the present tense is his distress. He was distressed over all that was happening. Jesus saw their stubborn hearts and it distressed his heart. Their constant failure to see that he truly was God in flesh, the Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus possessed a righteous anger over sin. We know that Paul writes that to the Ephesians, right? In your anger, do not sin. So anger doesn't have to be sinful, but it becomes sinful so quickly when we vent it on others. Why do we vent? Usually because it's not going our way. We've been hurt, perhaps. We feel threatened, and we lash out. Anger is also sinful when we internalize that anger, and we clam up, right? That kind of anger can become very destructive to one's own self. Physically, emotionally, we become sullen, we become miserable, and that's all sin. Anger, to be right, as seen in Jesus, has to be directed toward the issue, the problem, not the person, not oneself. We need to attack the problem, not people. Yes, anger is to be controlled. Proverbs 29, right? The key word there in the sense is, a key idea is that of restraint. In James 1, count to 10 if that helps. <laughs> count to 100 if that helps, right? Anger is to be controlled, we're to be people with emotions, but motions under the control of the Holy Spirit. Sinful anger is so based on resentment, it's based on self-pity, an unforgiving spirit. We can't let go, and it boils us to our core. We're holding sinfully to our own rights. It shows itself when we forget who we are in Christ. Well, let's look at the second emotion, point B. Christ expressed sorrow. Out of a caring heart, we can feel the sorrow of loss, of pain. Jesus experienced that deeply. In John chapter 11, you know this account. Lazarus, he loved this family. He loved Lazarus, a close friend. And even though he knows he's going to call him out of the grave to live again, he's filled with this deep sorrow, showing much emotion. But Christ sorrowed didn't control him and that's the key we can have sorrow we can have deep hurt deep experiences of loss but it still has to come under the control of the holy spirit do, do we we've got to learn that we've got to work on that through the help of the holy spirit because because sorrow when it's out of control paralyzes us have you been there you can't think straight you don't act right we we, we, we may not be able to function we got to bring that emotion under the holy spirit's control Christ's sorrow didn't control his mind. It didn't prevent him from thinking straight to know what he came to do, his purpose. We need to bring our sorrow under the control of the Holy Spirit. We gotta work at that. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and use us his way. Point C, third emotion. Christ expressed agony, right? It's, that, that's a very deep emotion, Jesus tells his disciples that he was going to die. John chapter 12. Jesus is in turmoil, yet he knew that he came for the purpose, didn't he, to die. But he's still in turmoil over that. He agonized over that. He, well, he's fully man, he's also fully God, fully human, fully God. But his agony didn't keep him from carrying out his purpose. Emotions are not to control us. We got to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus every day through the day because we go through emotional ups and downs all the time. Point D, another emotion, Christ expressed compassion. In Matthew chapter 9, we see Christ's heart of compassion and what it means to be deeply moved within, to have great concern. But that emotion is more than a feeling. It needs to lead to right action. That's a miss too much in our society. What do we do 
with those who are harassed or bullied or helpless. In our society today, do black lives matter? Yes, they do. I could be in trouble on this, but I want to say every life matters. Every life. It's not about color. It can't be. I've had two long conversations with two friends of mine who were black because I needed to balance my, walk through my thinking with those two. It was a great time. Does a policeman's life matter? Yeah. Does the unborn life matter? Yes. Does a child that's born into a horrible situation, does their life matter? Yes. Are we seeking to be involved to help those in need? Here in our community, we need to be. Many of you are involved in different ways. Please keep that up. Do you know what the greatest need is in our community? It's for people to hear the gospel and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's more important than any other battle out there because that's about one's life today and eternity. That's why we need to, to, to sh- we got pamphlets and we got a little 60-page book out in the foyer and I want to encourage you to take some of those, take one of those books, but what you have to do is you have to read it yourself and after you've read it, then you have a friend who doesn't know Jesus and you say, you know, I just read this. This was really helpful to me. Would you read it and then could we talk about it? That's the most important message that we can be concerned about, the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's other ways to be involved in helping others. We, we do CIA Day, maybe back, maybe this spring, right? And, and it's going out into our community to help those in need. That's a great thing. Thank you for those of you that do that. Lord willing, next summer, we'll be ministering to our children in Vacation Bible School. It's about the gospel to children. Maybe you'll commit yourself now to be a part of that. 20 bikes were gathered by you King's men and given to Ferry Street Ministry, led by our own Rick Pulowski, who ministers to people in need. How fantastic that was. We saw a little video clip of that. And, and we know Rick. My encouragement is help. Say, so what can I do to help in your ministry? How can I give to help in that? And there's other, other wonderful ministries of which some of you are a part of. Well of Grace. How can we help with that? Young Life. What can we do in that ministry? Give, support, when we're done with COVID, you know, or we're not done with COVID. Right now, you're doing what you can't do. You're giving faithfully. Last week, we saw Pastor, Pastor Tim talk about how you give faithfully to the benevolent fund to help people in need. We praise God for that, helping with tangible issues. During this Christmas season, right, we're giving, we're giving gifts and money cards uh, to, to our children's families that are part of Olay. And, and in talking with Jeff, we still need a lot more to be given. So if you can get to the website and look at what gifts we're still looking for, we got till tomorrow. So get them in tomorrow, would you please? You've given generously, giving gift cards to our military men and women just to brighten their Christmas day. Our Thanksgiving offering came to $7,000, which is divided up into three ways to help places of need. I think of so many of you who have gone on short-term missions trips You give up your work time. You give up your own money to go do that, to serve in some way. We're trying to plan a trip to Louisiana in April, and and it's a hands-on project because of Hurricane Delta and Laura. And maybe you want to be a part of that. Download the application, get it in, and be ready to go if we can go. If you've got questions, give Jeff Templeton a call, Director of Missions. Lord willing, we're going to try to go to no- in November back to Hungary and have, I'll be teaching in Judges and, and then we'll also have a work team going along. Maybe you want to be a part of that. With all the emotions in action, right? That's all motions, emotions in action, which lead to the last emotion that we're going to look at in Christ. And it's what's pictured here at the table before us. And the last point is it's about Christ's sacrificial love for us, Right? Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13. And I'll read the first verse there. And it was just before Passover festival. Jesus knew the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to his Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Boy, that's what our God does. Complete, full love. We know Romans 8, Romans, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates, shows his love for us. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the ultimate picture of love. 
with your Bibles open to John 13. Look at verses 2 through 5. And Jesus seizes the opportunity to demonstrate his humility. He does what only the servant was supposed to do. None of the disciples would wash the feet of the other, but Jesus did that. Look at the third verse. That's true love, selfless love. Love isn't about getting. Love is about giving unconditionally. No matter the response that another person were to love them selflessly. That's unconditional love. 1 John chapter 3 and 4. Love is action. Love is what we do. Love under control is seen in the perfect love of God, sending his son to be the price paid for our sin. We know that. That's what we're remembering at the Lord's table. Jesus was very emotional, but his emotions didn't rule his life. His emotions didn't control him. His emotions didn't control his emotions. Jesus, God-man, obviously was perfect in his emotions. I still think we'd see the red in his eyes from when he cried. I think we'd obviously hear his, his laughter and his exuberance and maybe even his loud voice in his anger. But in all of his emotions, they came under his purpose, doing what he is supposed to do, living as he is supposed to. And then it needs to be the same for you. You and I don't have any, any, any excuse that we're not to live that way. Our emotions are coming under the control of the Holy Spirit. That's how we have to live day in and day out. And when we don't, Let's confess that sin and turn from that sin. Full extent of emotion, but under the control of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's take a look at the emotions of historical figure King Herod. Point two, and we see emotion out of control. Take your Bibles. Please turn to Matthew chapter 2, our text. And we all know that we are not perfect in our lives. As children of God, though, we're to work at living our lives to please the Lord, to be holy and pure, living under the control of the Holy Spirit. There's lots of emotions at this time of year. Right? We know that. Normally, society puts lots of, lots, of, lots of pressures on us and our families, and advertisement upon advertisement, and money is spent, and travel is expected, and too much to do, and who can say no? But no matter what, we also put a lot of self-pressure. We put pressure on ourselves. And that pressure isn't from God. But I have to make Christmas special. Yes, it's supposed to be a joyous time, a great celebration of the gift of God, of his son to us. And we love our families, but we still need to bring balance in all that we do under the lordship of Christ. I want us to see some of the descriptive, descriptive words used in the text which describes the emotional makeup of King Herod. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Being out of control, right? Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And now these magi come to Jerusalem and they ask, who is this one who has been born king of the Jews? Wow, we saw a star in the east and we've traveled and we're here to worship him. And that's pretty significant and very unnerving if you were the sitting king. Verse three, Matthew wrote that he, Herod, is disturbed, means agitated. Literally, it means to shake or to stir up. Figuratively, it means to be thrown into confusion, to be emotionally upset. Emotion out of control, point A. It's being greatly upset or disturbed. Herod was upset. When he was, all Jerusalem was upset because they knew the makeup, the emotional makeup of their king. And when he was upset, look out, bad things happen. You can see some of those pictures in the scriptures. You know, some of us parents... We're like that at home. When dad's upset, when mom's at the end of her rope, look out. How horrible if that's the reaction of children. All of us were children. You might have had that growing up. Emotions out of control, we can be seen, point B, by being deceitful. Herod was deceitful. He hears from the magi, uh, these magi who come into their city, this question about this baby king. 
I mean, how disturbing would that be? Of course that's disturbing. And he calls the religious leaders together to find out where this baby was to be born. They knew the answer from Micah chapter 5. In Bethlehem, Judea. Herod then meets in, look at verse 7, with the Magi secretly. Verse 8, he lies to them, he deceives them. This man is evil, this man is wicked. Verse 12, this, 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 he, we see that, that God tells the Magi not to go back to Herod. Look at verse 16. What's the king's emotional makeup today? Well, he's furious. It's literally exceedingly angered, right? in rage, we might say. Emotion out of control. In his anger, he seeks to kill this baby king. And the collateral damage, he doesn't care. Oh, some have estimated it might, it's not a great number, maybe it was 20 babies. He has to destroy his competition. He doesn't care that every one of those babies that were murdered at the hands of this angry king. Collateral damage. <laughs> Look at verse 17 and 18. We see the prophecy of Jeremiah 31 being fulfilled. Herod is a man out of control. Does our temper get out of control? And we don't care what the collateral damage is to our family. Not at the moment. All that matters is that we win. We don't care what words we say. We don't care what we, how we demonstrate our anger. We've got to win. Win the fight. Win the battle. Win the argument. That's all that matters to us. Maybe some of us have some sins to confess before we come to the table. Emotion out of control can be seen, point C, by being consumed with oneself. Isn't that what that's about? That was Herod. He was wicked. He was a man of great power. He used great political manipulation. He had savvy in how he did it. In 63 B.C., click back in your mind, Pompey invaded Judah, brought it under the control of Rome. In Rome's control, he, they appointed Herod to be tetrarch, leader, head of Galilee in 47 B.C. In 40 B.C., Palestine was invaded by present-day Iran, or the Parthians, and civil war broke out. So Herod flees back to Rome. And by the Roman Senate, they now nominate him to be king of Judea. And, and he's given an army, and he, carve out, he carves out his kingdom. He takes control. It was no easy task, but he's a powerful man. According to Josephus, first century Jewish historian, Herod began his role in 37 B.C., dies in 4 B.C., so Christ has to be born prior to 4 B.C., in 37 B.C., in the midst of this, Emperor Augustus enlarged his rule to all of Palestine, so now he truly is king of the Jews. Herod, with his great jealousy, clung to his position until the day of his death. He was not a Jew, but he practiced Judaism because it was good for his in his kingship. He was a great builder. He built his palace up in Samaria. He adored Samaria, adorned it. He built Caesarea on the Mediterranean, he enlarged many other cities. He enlarged and rebuilt, re added to the temple that was first built under Zerubbabel, the restored temple. We're hoping to go back to Israel in November of 22. Um, maybe you want to be a part of it. We'll see these places. Herod was capable of exacting taxes. He used the system. He got Israel through a very terrible drought. He was very resourceful. But he was crafty. He was wicked. He was deceitful. His jealousy and rage was over his position. He murdered one of his wife's brothers as well as grandfather. He had his, one of his wives put to death as well as her mother and two of his own sons he killed, murdered. He was a paranoid man because he had to have power and position and he had to protect himself. Jealous of anyone who was a threat to his power. He was a man out of control. I, I hope that none of us would be described as a person out of control. How does that impact those around us? These magi arrive from the east, and he's alarmed. And we see his anger and rage. We could say that he assembled, he summons, he sends, he kills, and he himself dies. Herod the Great, man out of control, a man who was controlled by his self-centeredness, Self-centeredness 
is being out of control. Some application, what are we like when we're controlled by that self-centeredness? Life is all about me, my heart, my emotions, my feeling, my anger, what you did to me, my pleasures, the hurt you caused me. And then we get angry and we take it out on you because you did this to me. That's emotion out of control. Well, lastly, let's take a look at the emotions of Joseph, chosen by God to be the husband to Mary. So point three, emotions under right control. Take your Bibles, turn back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And we see the emotions of Joseph. Point A, we see compassion that needs to temper our righteousness. I, I love that thought. Look at chapter 1, verse 18. Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, and before they came together, she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph doesn't know that. All he knows is that Mary's pregnant, and it's not his child. And with this situation, Joseph has the opportunity to kind of stick it to Mary. I mean, how I, he had to have felt betrayed by her. No one likes betrayal. How do we handle betrayal? She had sexually sinned, he thought. Verse 18, they're engaged. We've got to understand engagement is a bit different than, than in our society. Engagement was just as binding as marriage. If you were engaged, you were bound to that person. The only way you could be broke, break that is either through a divorce or through a death. Otherwise, you were bound to that marriage, to be married. This unfaithfulness in engagement period, as in marriage, would be considered to be adultery. And according to the Old Testament, punishable by death. By first century, they didn't really carry that out. Rather, the sin would be brought public. In this situation, with all that Joseph knew, he could have been, quote, righteous and proved that he wasn't the father, that he was sexually pure. When we're deeply hurt, it's not too hard to react strongly, right? I've been there, you've been there. Especially when we're, we're innocent, we didn't do anything wrong. How angry and betrayed he must have felt. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. He was going to show compassion in this, which is awesome. Again, he could exonerate himself and prove himself to be righteous, that, he was, that she didn't become pregnant by him prior to their marriage, that he was righteous and that he was faithful. He could have made her a public example pointing out her sin publicly to exonerate himself publicly. But Joseph shows compassion out of love, out of compassion. He didn't want to humiliate her publicly. He knew he couldn't marry her. That was a consequence of her sin, so he thought. So she, he would divorce her and, and break off the engagement Two witnesses would have to be present, at least two witnesses, with the giving her of the certificate of divorce. And it would state the reasons. He wouldn't have to read them out loud. Take a moment. You think about emotional balance between righteousness on the one hand and compassion on the other. You know, both of those are, the, are right. Both of those are very biblical. We should, we should be righteous and we should be compassionate. So how do you put those two together? Do we not? Do we just let him go extreme? What we see in Joseph is a balance and control. You know, out of righteousness, sometimes we want to nail that offender and stick it to him because of what they've done. They were so wrong. The other extreme, which is just as wrong to go to that extreme, would be compassion that would say, well, you know, they sinned. It was really terrible sin, but you know, I'm guilty of terrible sin, and I shouldn't be anybody to point my finger at them, so I'm just going to let it pass. I'm not going to talk about the sin. That equally is wrong. Sin is sin. You, 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 if ever you're going to speak about sin, that's, that's a judgment call. You just lied. That's a sin. And sin has to be dealt with. There's no question about that. And yet we need to deal with it in a compassionate way. Lamentations chapter 3. What a statement. If God would have dealt with us as our sins deserve us to be dealt with, we'd spend eternity in hell. But God's anger, his wrath for sin, 
wasn't placed on us. It was placed on his son who died in our place, paid the price for our sin. Sin is still dealt with. It's got a register in the mind. Sin must be dealt with. We look at the elements of the Lord's Supper and we're reminded that sin does not go unpunished. Christ's body was broken because of our sin. His blood was poured out. He died because of our sin. The compassion wasn't on his son. The compassion was on us, God's compassion. 1 Peter chapter 3, we see the same truth. Righteousness tempered with compassion. What, what do we learn about emotions? Point B, fear can be soothed by God's word. I trust you know that. The angel of the Lord brings good God's word to Joseph in a dream. Look at verses 20 to 23. And we see that Joseph has fear. And how often we fear what lies ahead. We fear the unknown. Joseph did. He needed to make some decisions. He, what should be done? And I'm sure he wrestled through the night. We do too. And we can see anxiety. You know, we're, we're, we're anxious. Maybe we were, we're wringing our hands. We, I, can't, I can't, can't get that deep breath. Have you been there? Because you've got so much anxiety going on. And what are we to do? Well, we got to bring those emotions under the control of the Lord. Joseph was wrestling with what to do. He thought he had made up his mind, but he still wasn't sure. So what do we see? Come on, we can smile here. That God's word can soothe our fears. You know that, I know that. Through God's angel, Gabriel, or God's a, a, angel, a, a God explains what happened. That he, what is conceived in Mary, is God himself. It's the incarnation, it's a miracle. She's conceiving out of the work of the Holy Spirit, not another man. She was a virgin. She still was a virgin after she con conceived and gave birth. And then Joseph and Mary had sexual union. Not till then. He, this one in her is fully God, God in flesh. He's Yahshua, right? Yahweh saves. Listen, God is good. And you and I know he is good all the time, no matter what we're going through. And I trust that you go to God's word when you have fear and when you're troubled. God's word can soothe our fear. You know, we think of the stress that we're going through with COVID-19 and all the things that have happened. And we fear and we worry. And it's impacted our lives physically and it's impacted our lives with health or work or emotionally. But I'll tell you one thing, COVID-19 better not interrupt our lives spiritually. Right? Right? Because our heart and our mind and our spirit needs to be right in tune with our Lord. No matter what we're going through. The rest of that stuff, yeah, that can be really hard. What do we learn about emotions? Point C, peace comes through obedience. Let's let that register and ring around in our heads. Peace comes through obedience. When we're obedient to the Lord, right? Don't you, you know the peace that you have. I know when I'm not living in obedience to the word of God that I, I'm not happy and good inside. Joseph obeyed. He acted on God's word. He took Mary home as his wife. And instead of relying on his own thoughts, he trusted the word of God. His way would have brought in fear. God's way, obedience, brought peace. Peace comes in obedience, it really does. We close this morning, we come to the Lord's table. God created us in his likeness, in his image. God is a person, therefore we're persons. God has personality, therefore we have personality. God has emotions, that's why we have emotion. We're the, we've been created in the image of God, even though it's been marred by sin. And in these emotions, we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus in our emotional makeup. Jesus experienced the full reins of reign of emotion. We can do that too. We sure can. He wasn't passive in his emotions. Some of us more than others are more emotional. Some of us just don't cry. Others of us do. Some laugh wholeheartedly and others barely laugh. That, that's, that's not the issue. Who you are and your personality. What matters though is that our emotions come under the control of the Holy Spirit. We can't be like Herod, out of control, controlling ourselves. All that matters is how we're treated, what, what, what happens to us and our needs and our rights and our wants. We need our emotions controlled by our Lord. 
we have to stay focused on what his purpose is. And we've got to be able to say, that's the way I need to live day in and day out for his purpose. It's living out the fruit of the Spirit. You know, Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's how we're to live. Under the control of the Holy Spirit and the evidence will be seen in us. That's emotional balance. This morning as we come to the table, we remember Christ's love for us. His love for you. Would you renew your heart and allow him to have control of your emotions? Let's bow for prayer. Heads bowed. I want us to pray a little bit silently. I want us to think a little bit. Paul said, before we eat of the bread, drink of the cup, we've got to examine our hearts to make sure they're right. Would you pray and think through your emotional makeup? Do you need to make some things right emotionally? Are your emotions controlling you? That's sin, and you need to confess it. Is your anger selfish? Is there unbalanced sorrow? Is there fear because you're not trusting the Lord? Compassion? but you're not dealing with sin? If your emotions are controlling you, confess that, talk to the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you bring that in balance. As we come to the table, let's remember Christ's selfless love for us, what he did for us, so that we can come to Christ fully as a believer and let him control our lives fully. Would you pray about those things as a believer? If you're here this morning or you're watching online, if you've not placed your faith in Jesus, why not do that today? Christ paid the price so that we can have peace and joy that comes from Christ to fill our hearts. He paid the debt that we couldn't pay. He paid it all for us. If it's your desire to step into a right relationship with the Lord, then right now, silently, you pray. Silently, you say, Dear Jesus, I understand. You died on that cross to pay for my sin. I turn from that sin. Forgive me. Cleanse me. I take and receive you now as my sacrifice of my sin, my Savior. I surrender myself to you. If that's your prayer, let me know. It. Contact me, call, text, email. Any one of our staff members, we would love, we want to talk with you to encourage you.